a reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Brothers and sisters, now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has freed you from the law of sin and death. For what the law, weakened by the flesh, was powerless to do, this God has done. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for the sake of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the righteous decree of the law might be fulfilled in us, who live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh are concerned with the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit with the things of the Spirit. The concern of the flesh is death, but the concern of the Spirit is life and peace. But the concern of the flesh is hostility toward God. It does not submit to the law of God, nor can it. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh. On the contrary, you are in the Spirit, if only the Spirit of God dwells in you. Whoever does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is alive because of righteousness. If the Spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his Spirit that dwells in you. The word of the Lord. Lord, this is the people that longs to see your face. The Lord's are the earth and its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it, for he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who can ascend the mountain of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He whose hands are sinless, whose heart is clean, who desires not what is vain. Lord, Lord, He shall receive a blessing from the Lord, a reward from God his Savior. Such is the race that seeks for him, that seeks the face of the God of Jacob. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Lucam. Some people told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with the blood of their sacrifices. He said to them in reply, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way that they were greater sinners than all other Galileans? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those 18 people who were killed when the Tower of Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than everyone else who lived in Jerusalem? By no means. But I tell you, if you do not repent, 
you will all perish as they did. And he told them this parable. There once was a person who had a fig tree planted in his orchard. And when he came in search of fruit on it, but found none, he said to the gardener, for three years now I have come in search of fruit on this fig tree, but have found none. So cut it down. Why should it exhaust the soil? He said to him in reply, Sir, leave it for this year also, and I shall cultivate the ground around it and fertilize it. It may bear fruit in the future. If not, you can cut it down. Verbum Domini. It was just two months ago that Jordan and Andre Anchando had gone to the Walmart with their two-month-old baby, Paul, in El Paso, Texas, to get some things for the little girl's birthday party, when suddenly gunshots, gunshots rang out. And Jordan took her little infant, two months old, and held him, like we can think of Our Lady uh, holding Jesus, held him, shielded him from the, the bullets, and her husband, Andre, shielded both the mother and his son from the bullets. And both of the parents died, but that little child survived. We could think of our Lady and St. Joseph protecting the child Jesus from uh, the cruel Her Herod and taking him to Egypt. And what that shows us really is that they loved, e they loved something more than themselves. There was something that they saw greater that was worth laying their lives down for, worth the sacrifice of their very lives protecting their little infant boy, Paul, just two months old. And Archbishop Charles Chaput uses this couple as an example in an address that he gave at Notre Dame University this past October 11th. And the title of his talk was, Things Worth Dying For, The Nature of a Life Worth Living. He begins this talk that he gave at Notre Dame, he said, by saying that his dad was a mortician in a small Kansas town. So he said, in my family, death and all the complex emotions that surround it were a natural part of living. To put it another way, the meaning of a sentence becomes clear when we put a period at the end of it. You're reading through a sentence, you're not sure what the intent of the writer is until you see the period, period, and then you know the meaning of that sentence. And he says, so the same applies to life. When we talk about things worth dying for, we're really talking about the things worth living for, the things that give life meaning. Thinking a little about our mortality puts the world in perspective. It helps us see what matters and also the foolishness of grasping at things that finally don't matter. Your hearse, as my father might say, won't have a luggage rack. So what is it that is worth sacrificing our lives for? It reveals, he says, where our love is, what our love is. He also brings out in this talk how we can talk about a number of natural loves. Jesus himself said there's no greater love than to lay down your friends, lay down your life for your friends. And that on the battlefield, there are so many stories of soldiers who did just that. They laid down their lives for the sake of their comrades. And he says that all true friendship requires a readiness to die. If not literally, then in the sense of dying to ourselves, dying to our impatience 
and our reluctance to make sacrifices for others. The willingness to be with our friends when they're not easily lovable, to accompany them in their neediness or to share in their suffering, this is the test of true friendship. So this, we're seeing you know, just the effect of a natural love, the love of the parents for this infant, the love of the soldiers for his comrades on the field. But he says, as Christians, though, we claim to be animated first and foremost by a supernatural love. Love for God as our creator and Jesus Christ as his son. And we can think that in a lot of countries today, the decision for Jesus Christ or death is a real one. It's a real possibility for many Christians living throughout the world. And when we read some of their stories, he says that we're, we're, we're anxious because we wonder if we were in that same situation, would we deny the Lord? Would we make the same decision that they did to be faithful even until death? But he gives us a, a, a point, I think, to encourage us. Because he says, the fear of martyrdom is the beginning of an honest appraisal of our spiritual mediocrity. That it also puts before us the judgment of God, the coming judgment of God. We feel that we're lackluster, really, in living out our faith in so many ways. And we wonder how we will do before God in our test uh, before God. He said, the Catholic faith we hold doesn't deny our failures. It highlights them to help us see that our hope is not in the strength of our own love, but rather in the power of God's love. The martyrs do not bear witness to the spiritual athleticism of remarkable men and women Instead, they point to the relentless love of God in Jesus Christ. It's God who gave him the grace. And I love the example that Corey ten Boom tells. And as Nazism was growing in Europe, and they're living in Holland, and they see it advancing toward them, Corey asks her father, you know, how do we know if we're going to be strong enough for the test of martyrdom? She herself spent time in a concentration camp. And her father wisely said to her, you know, what? when do I give you the train fare when you take the train? And she said, right before I get on the train. He says, well, that's what the Lord does. You don't have the grace for martyrdom right now, but he will give you that grace when you need it. And Archbishop Chaput points out what the preface for the martyrs says. For you, God, are glorified when your saints are praised. Their very sufferings are but wonders of your might. In your mercy, you give ardor to their faith, to their endurance, you grant firm resolve. And in their struggle, the victory is yours through Christ our Lord. So we can trust God is faithful. As Archbishop point, uh, points out, he says, those who are faithful to God will turn will in turn have his faithfulness at life's ending, no matter how extreme the test. And I've experienced that so many times in visiting those who are dying. There's like this grace. And you can even see the serenity in the person who's, they strove to live a, a holy life during their life and they're now at the end of their life, but they have this this peace, this serenity, this grace, this God's faithfulness and helping them to courageously face the end. God will give us the graces we need. He's faithful. He will help us to be faithful, whatever the test might be in our lives. The Archbishop pointed out, you know, that this is something that's really a question that's relevant for us today, that he says, you young people your young scholars will have a hard, a hard time getting a job at many American universities if you think that marriage is only possible between a man and a woman and you make the mistake about talking about it. 
these are real things, you know, that we are going to be, he says, believers can expect a rough road in the years ahead on a whole range of issues. But God will be faithful to us. And so in today's readings, Jesus speaks about the reality of the suddenness of these Galileans, death or those in Jerusalem on whom a tower had fallen. He said they weren't any more guilty than anyone else, but you need to repent. You need to get your life right before God, to be ready, to be vigilant, as he says so often in so many other places. And then when the fruit, he speaks about the, the fruit tree, you know, twice we read in the Gospels, once in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 19, and Mark's Gospel, chapter 11, 13, that Jesus went to a fig tree and he only found leaves. He says, you're never going to bear fruit again. Well, he was bringing out that point, really, that we all have to bear this fruit, this fruit of love, this fruit of generosity and love, of self-giving love. And we're not called, as he says, our the archbishop says, the culture just turns us in on ourselves and just living for ourselves, but it's going outside of ourselves in love. And when we go outside of ourselves in love to God, it's he that enables us to do that, and our love grows, and he's always faithful to us. And St. Paul in Romans chapter 8, he speaks a lot about the Spirit and how the Spirit is the one who helps us in our weakness. So we heard today, for what, the, for what the law weakened by the flesh was powerless to do, this God has done by sending his own Son. And he's now fulfilled in this in us who live not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. The concern of the flesh is death, but the concern of the spirit is life and peace. That's what the spirit is bringing us to, life and peace and, and a power to love. And finally, today's reading concluded, if the spirit of the one who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, the one who raised Christ from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies also through his spirit that dwells in you. So challenging times, yes, but in every age there's always been challenges. In every part of the world there are different challenges that believers face. But we can trust in God's fidelity to us. And we pray during this Mass that he will strengthen those who are undergoing severe persecutions for their faith that he will strengthen us in the challenges that we face in our own time so that we can be those witnesses of his life and his love and be faithful to him until the end. May the Holy Spirit give us all the gift of fortitude, the gift of fortitude by which we'll be strong and faithful to the Lord until the end.